Welcome to Our Star Speak. My name is Christina Miner. I am the host of this podcast. And before I begin, well, we begin, I would like to give a disclaimer that we are not claiming to be medical professionals or any other form of professionals that you may have in your life that's helping you with your treatment plan. You may even hear something that you like and you may want to try or some advice or something that we suggest, but it doesn't mean that we're telling you to utilize it at all. We do not want you going against your medical advisors or anyone that's in your life helping you with your treatment plan. We're just merely here for support and to give some information and to tell our story. So tonight we have Mimi Frazier. I am so excited because Mimi, I met Mimi is one of my inspirations for being flat. For when I went flat, I found her through another flat organization. Um, not putting on a shirt. And then I also found her through staying tall, like she was everywhere. So as I started following Mimi and just seeing how bold she was with actually, you know, just being who she was, being who she is and being flat and advocating, she became an inspiration of her pictures. I don't know if any of y'all seen the real, but her pictures are phenomenal. So thank you for joining me tonight, Mimi. Thank you for having me. That was <laughs> exceptional uh introduction I love it thank you so much <laughs> just you and you know you and I've had a conversation and yeah we like we're both real people and yeah. I think that's what really makes me kind of like gravitate towards you because you're just who you are like love it or leave it here I am and I think that's beautiful about you so you know here on our scar speak we like to hear the story but we like to hear it from before during and now so before we even start that I and everybody else, I'm sure, want to know who is Mimi, not the advocate, not the breast cancer survivor. Who do you describe yourself as? Honestly, before I even went through my cancer journey, I would consider myself a warrior. You know, um, as like a lot of people in the world, um, I, I had a pretty tumultuous childhood and things like that. So being as though I went through so many different things, it kind of grounded me to be a certain type of person. So I've always was like a hard worker, but I was more or less um, more carefree and things like that. And kind of just like did my own thing. Being diagnosed kind of just like put everything into perspective and you kind of got to like get yourself together. So that's basically how the transition happened with me. I was just basically working, living life, you know, going to school, um, saving. I wanted to buy a house at the time. So I had no idea what was in store for me. So I just was basically living life. You know, I was um, 33, 34 um, when everything kind of transpired. So during that time, I was in my early 30s and kind of getting things together, living my life, um, you know, before everything kind of happened. Right, right. So you consider yourself a warrior. And that's interesting because, you know, we use that word a lot in the breast cancer community as far as like us being a warrior. But I think you said something that was very important is the fact that before even breast cancer, you were already a warrior. You were already that strong person because you had to be because of some of the things that you had gone through. And it's yeah. interesting because sometimes it seems like our past can even compare, prepare us for even the unknown of things like cancer. So mm -hmm. you're 33, living life, I'm sure, just enjoying life, going about your own business. And mm -hmm. how did you, did you find the lump? Like, what did that look like? Um, and because it sounds like you were kind of like at the, because usually when we're younger, um, you know, they say under 51, that, you know, you, you may have kids, you may have a job, you may have the beginning of a career or whatever the case may be. But how did that kind of catapult into, oh my God, now I got breast cancer? Like what led up to it? Did you have symptoms? Well, honestly, um, after I was diagnosed, I was told that I possibly had it since high school, but just didn't wow. know about anything. Like there was always a, small little, basically like an ingrown hair when I was in high school underneath my arm that would go away, that would come back. But as I got older, it kind of just like stayed and started to like change color. Then it started to get painful. So I will honestly say, um, this is why I advocate so hard for early um, detection and making sure you get your doctor's appointments and not listening to people when you know something is wrong. I was misdiagnosed um, when I was probably about five years before I finally found out. I was misdiagnosed and told that I had fibrocystic breast disease. And not to worry, most Black women have um, lumps and things like that are, that are benign, but there was no testing done or anything. And I feel like it was up to me to advocate for myself at that point, but I didn't. So for whatever no. reason, 
continued to live my life. I continued with the pain that had started to be painful. I couldn't wear bras anymore. I couldn't even putting on a shirt or taking off a shirt became difficult. Washing myself, I started to feel different things. Then it turned colors. And then finally, um, I was engaged at the time. My fiance was just like, hey, what's that? You know, um, we got to figure this out. So I went to the doctor, found out, you know, this is possibly breast cancer. I went and got a biopsy. And that's when they told me I was stage 3B. So I was like right at stage four's door. Um, the doctor told me if I would have waited maybe like even a month more, um, that it would have been a whole different outcome for me. So I'm very blessed and I'm very thankful that I caught it when I did. And we started um, active chemotherapy. I had to get both my breasts removed. I had to have um, my fallopian tubes, my um, ovaries removed, all of that. Um, almost like immediately one thing after another. And so-, so- I'm sorry for cutting you off, but did you no, have like a family history of breast cancer? No, like that's the no family thing. history. Genetics testing um, while dur- during mm-hmm. chemo and all that. And there was no breast cancer like detected on either side of my family, although there was cancer, but not breast cancer. Okay, so let me ask you about that. So you did the bra- you did the BRCA testing and all that. Yeah. And it came back negative, right? Okay. So with that being said, you had cancer in your family. Now, was it that men were having cancer and they weren't being tested for the BRCA gene or, you know, because sometimes I've seen where people, it's not necessarily breast cancer in the family, but maybe it was right. prostate or cancer linked to right. breast cancer, but no one ever got a genetic testing. Did that there was, happen? There was, I don't know of any testing as far as the males, like my grandfather, any uncles or anything like that. I know my grandmother had cancer. I believe it was lung cancer. And my mother, me and my mother kind of were diagnosed. She was diagnosed a little bit before me. And then I was diagnosed, but she had a different type of cancer, um, like um, colon or renal type of cancer that my mom had. So it didn't have anything to do with um, my type of breast cancer um, or my type of cancer period. So I was very surprised just to see um, what I did have a lot of on both sides of the family was just like heart attacks and heart disease and things like that. But it kind of like skipped that and went right to cancer for me, you know? Right, right. Mm-hmm. And that's, it, our stories are very similar because I, well, I didn't have anybody in my family I know of have cancer, but it was sort of like I was the chosen one to have it. <laughs> you know? And you know yeah. how that can be. It's like, dad, where did I even come from? Um, so you found, so you said you had like an ingrown hair. Mm-hmm. And you're the first person I heard of that. Now I've heard people talk about cyst. I heard people talk about like an abscess looking type situation, but no one I've known thus far talked yep. about ingrown. So did this ingrown hair that you had that obviously your doctors are now saying was linked, did it ever like ooze or discharge? Did you have any issues with your nipples or anything like yes. that? Yes, okay. I have. So it wasn't just it, it, it. This was a tumor. It 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 was okay. a tumor. like it wasn't an ingrown hair. I thought it was that. That's why I, I put in my mind. I think as I was going along with it, ignoring it, like oh, it's just something. You know, I'll figure it out. It's not what I think it is until um, my right um, side, my right breast nipple started to go inward mm. and to feel different types of like lumps and all these different things on the inside. And then it just became like hard and nothing was happening. It was, it didn't start to ooze, but by that time I had already like gone in and tried to find out what was going on, got the biopsy. And then they told me what I needed to do. So I actually chemo and I visibly saw the tumor that was on the side go down, down, down until it was almost invisible. That was like incredible. That was incredible. Now it didn't, same effect to the t- uh, tumors that were inside of my breast. It didn't have the same effect. They didn't go down as much, but they went down. So it was necessary for me to get that breast removed in particular, but I chose to get a double, just a full mastectomy because I didn't want to, that was horrifying to me. And I didn't want to go through that again. I was like, if, if I have to deal with that, then you might as well just take both of them. Right. Yeah. So, you, so you found, you found, they gave you the biopsy. And then mm-hmm. you found out that you had breast cancer. And not, as we all know, things start speeding up like fast. very bad. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm sure even faster in your situation because of the stage that you were at, which is 3B. Like you said, you were knocking on four. 
because yes. um, that's close. I think that's the next one, right? Four is after 3D. Mm -hmm. um, so with that being said, did, did they tell you like how fast it was growing, like the grade of it and what type of cancer it was? I, I was just told that it was invasive breast cancer, um, okay. uh, 3B invasive breast cancer, very aggressive, and that was estrogen based. And that okay. um, I am to not have much estrogen in my body. If I do, then that's what is keeping feeding the cancer cells because I'm not out of the clear. Like I, I don't, you know, I'm a lot of people, they're like, well, are you in remission? And it's like, that's so funny to me because I want to say yes. However, I'm treated like a stage four mm. cancer. I have cancer infusions. I have to go in for labs every week. Like I'm constantly in MRIs and different scans because they want to just make sure everything is fine. And so that's very difficult for me to deal with because I don't want to be looked at like I'm, oh, I'm so sick and things like that. But some weeks, some months, like I'm not good. You know, some right. weeks I'm good. Like I'm, I'm up every day. I'm able to do things. But typically after my infusions, like I have a really hard time with like walking. It's caused a lot of nerve damage in my legs. It's caused like so much cancer in general has just like totally taken over my body. And right. now I'm like trying to take it one step at a time. So my cancer was very aggressive. And to this day, um, I'm still being told that I will have to be in this infusion for up to the next 10 years. Okay. So it's something that I have to look forward to. I've taken time away. I've said, hey, I can't do this anymore because my quality of life is gone bad. I can't walk. I can't eat. However, I want to live. Right. I want to survive. So whatever it is that I have to do, that's what I'm doing. So they have me on like the strongest form of treatment that I can get right now, although I'm not metastatic, I am on a metastatic infusion treatment. Okay. And so that's the only one that my body has taken effect to. All of the other tamoxifen, anastrozole, all those other exemethane and all those, my body completely rejected. And I ended up in the hospital off of them. So, so, so let's go back a little bit to when you got your diagnosis and then they brought you the treatment plan. Yes. Because, and the reason why I want to bring this up and like, why well, I love to hear everybody's story with when you found out, when you went in for your first consultation, did they present everything to you? Because I'm finding that some people aren't presented all the time with the full treatment plan they could possibly have more so with when it comes to reconstruction versus not reconstruction, but play, if you don't mind, talk about when you went into the doctor's office and they actually told you this is what you have. These are the results and these are the steps potentially you need to take. Basically, um, it was very flat out, to be honest. I don't have like a good story about, you know, most women have like, oh, my doctor was so wonderful. I know they were so supportive. Like, no, that's not at all how it came to me. How it came to me was that you have stage 3B bre breast cancer. You need to get your breast removed immediately. Um, okay. I, they never talked to me about um, infertility, like all those things. Like oh. if I, maybe if what my plans were, nothing. I didn't get that talk until like after I was already in chemo. And it's like, well, you possibly can save your eggs because I actually got pregnant before I started radiation, but I ended up miscarrying because my body rejected it. Right. But. I, they didn't tell me initially everything that were everything that was my options. Even with the reconstruction, I was more or less like not feeling it, but they didn't talk to me about it. It wasn't an option. So it's not like I even had something to go off of. It was just, right. you, this is what you need to do. We're going to get started now. So did you, did you know, I guess not, I'm not, I'm just assuming based mm -hmm. on what you're saying, did you even know, like, maybe I should get a second opinion? No. You have I, any type of advocacy because you know you and I are real big on advocacy about helping yeah. people go through the process and not yeah. everybody. That's why I want you to share that part because not everybody understand. If you don't understand or if you think you may have questions, get that second opinion. Talk to someone who's already been through breast cancer or get connected to groups. Um, so with your situation, you because you didn't know Kim then, like you didn't know people then, and was so you were there by yourself. Yeah, there was no time for that. It was no time right. for me, like, hey, let me go get another opinion or, hey, let me figure it out. Like, my doctor made it very clear that I had no time to be trying yeah. to fix it. The, by the time I got online and started to, like, really share everything, I was already, like, in the midst of things. I didn't even know what I wanted to do. 
I hadn't even created Linkage Beauty. It was just, I was just there and trying to find some sort of like home or community for myself. I knew I wasn't the only person out there going through this. So I kind of wanted to put myself out there, but I kind of baby stepped it. And then I started to get like um, contacted by all these different women, some who are no longer with us, you know, who are like watching over us in heaven. But some women kind of like got me out of my shell and was like, hey, share your story. Come on here and talk to us or things like that. And that's how I kind of got the feel for it. And I kind of in, in my heart, I was just like, I need to be some type of voice for women that don't have people to talk to, don't right. have people kind of guide them in the right direction. We don't all have like the strong um, sense to like, okay, I need to do this. I need to do that. Like I lost everything when I was diagnosed, like my job fired me two weeks after and was like, come back to us when your cancer goes away. It was a lot. And so I didn't know what to do, you know? So I kind of had to like put on my big girl panties and kind of just start making things happen. Granted, I did have certain people come in and try to um, facilitate like, hey, why don't you start contacting this? Why don't you start contacting that? But once I got in the swing of things, it was like, it was, I just took off from there. It was like, I'm not only doing it for everyone. Right. And then I- I mean, from your standpoint, because it was so aggressive, I see what you're saying now. Your situation it wasn't, they didn't tell you things, but at the same time, they had, it seems like they had to work quick because of the yeah. type of cancer you there had. Was, it wasn't like they were trying to be purposely yeah. holding information from you. Yeah, there was an urgency with the matter. It wasn't like I, I had time to waste. It was like, they, you need to get in chemo now. And I kind of was resistant to chemo. Like, I don't want to. And they're like, uh you kind of don't have a choice, like if you want to survive. And so I really didn't have a chance to process it. I was processing it as I was going through it. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think honestly, that's a lot of us, like we process it as we go do the best that we can, but it's so important to have people in your corner that have been there. Um, at least lean on, because it seems like you didn't, you just didn't have that because everything had to move so quick. You didn't have time to maybe explore things like you normally would. You had to, you had to move. With yeah. that being said, when you went through chemo, like what type of chemo did you have and how long did you have to, how long were you on the chemo? I was in chemo. I started on my birthday, February the 9th, 2016, and I was in until July first um 2016 that's how long I was in chemo for and I got it every two weeks Mm -hmm. um it was very aggressive I got the red devil for sure because that was something that they always talked about Mm -hmm. that's what kind of made me feel the worst so I had like a very strong concoction um type of chemo my hair immediately came out um everything like my hair my eyelashes eyebrows every hair on my body came out and I've never been the same ever since. Like your body kind of reconstructs itself, but you're never the same person that you were before this happened. So I'm still to this day trying to process it. I'm still to this day trying to rebuild my body back in whatever way I can, whatever that looks like. Um, And I'm still um, struggling as far as like health wise. Like I try to um, portray a positive motivational person because we don't want people to look at us as a victim or you know feel sorry for us you know but for the most part most of the time I can barely like walk on my own and it's hard you know things like that so I want people to know that you can get through it you just have to keep fighting it's not easy like no one said it would be easy I didn't know seven years down the line I would still be going through this but I'm a fighter and I'm not going to give up because I have so much to do I have so much work still to do here absolutely so you go through chemo and then you had radiation, correct? Or no? Mm-hmm. You did? Yes. Okay. How long was the radiation? Radiation was supposed to be for about, was supposed to be four months, but it ended up being like six months because it was in Baltimore every day. Like it was supposed to be for three months every single day. And that was like impossible for me. Like I didn't drive. I was relying on my dad to take me every day. So some days I missed, you know, I wasn't able to go every day, but it turned into a longer process than it needed to be. But it was, it was a very trying time. So it ended up being for six months. So, well, and also you said that you lost everything like during this. So you didn't have the ability to really go on your own like you normally would have. So you go through chemo, you go through radiation. When did the surgery happen? Did it happen before or after? When did that happen? After my chemo was in 2000 and um, chemo and radiation 2016. Um my surgery didn't come until 2018. Really? 
Because that was something that they were like um, a bit, they were part, some of my doctors was like flat out hysterectomy, ovaries, fallopian tubes, uterus, everything. Some of my doctors were like, just the ovaries, just the fallopian tubes. And some doctors were like nothing at all. So they were like kind of going at it with each other to try to figure it out. And I kind of made the executive decision on what is best for me in the long run. I don't want to have to come back eventually because something has gone wrong or I don't want to get pregnant and then lose my baby again. You know, I don't want to go through any, any more hardships. So what is it that I need to do that best for me and as best for the diagnosis that I have? And so what was best turned it turned out to be a salpingo oophorectomy, which okay. is fallopian tubes in my ovaries only. Okay. All right. So that was, oh, okay. So you had to get that done. Now, did you, the double mastectomy that you had, was that before chemo? That was right after chemo. Right after chemo. Then you have radiation. Then you had the hysterectomy. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. So. Yeah, I I can't even imagine because if you had a if you had a miscarriage before, no, if you had a miscarriage before, I can definitely understand why you don't want to turn around and potentially possibly get pregnant and then go through another miscarriage because within that is a lot of uh that mental was, torment. Yeah, that was I mean, yeah, I've had one and it's not yeah, it's not they easy. Happy at all when I got pregnant. They wanted me to terminate it immediately. And I was like, no, you know, I was willing to just like, if I leave, if I go and my baby is left here, then I'll be happy with that. Like I was willing to go the long way with that because I just wanted to be a mother so bad. I didn't want that chance to be taken away from me with that. But you know, it it just is what it is. You know, think everything happens for a reason and I went through, you know, my heartache and depression as far as that goes, but I'm trying to look at the the other side, which is I with adopt, I can always foster. There are children all over the world that need families and parents. So that's my next mission that I'm, I'll be working on. And you stated that they did not inform you any information about potentially saving your ovaries? Not until after. She was just like, oh, my doctor came in. I'm never going to forget. She was just like, oh, I didn't realize that you wanted to have kids in the future. And it's like, uh, I'm 34. Like what that after your surgery? No, this, well, um, this was during chemo. This was during chemo time. I had to get my, my times together. This is my, my doctor during chemo going for my, you know, checkups and things like that. We were talking. And one day she was like, you know, I never asked you if you wanted to be a mom in the future, because everything just happened so fast. Yeah. And I was do. She gave me some paperwork, but by that time, in my heart, I felt that it was already too late, but I ended up getting pregnant anyway, you know? So it was for me, but it wasn't safe. It wasn't something that they would have suggested. She would have never said, go get pregnant now if you can, you know? Right. So I, I want to say that that's why it wasn't presented to me. I don't want to make it seem like oh, I understand. they aren't telling me because of, you know, the obvious things that we all, we always want to kind of go fall back on. I want to kind of also give room that my cancer was that aggressive, that it was no time for that. You You're know, they, to save your life. it was urgent, urgent, urgent. Like we have to do this now. So I just was following what they were telling me to do. Mm -hmm. Do I think about it? Like maybe I should have, but I probably wouldn't even be here if I decided to like not listen to them. And so I have to look at it in that aspect that I'm still here. You do, because honestly, it's just a tight situation that I think all of us are in when we hear that those words that we have it, because on one end, we may be thinking about things in the future or present things that we may want to do. But then at the same time, it's like, I got to live to even be able to do this. Or even if I like in, I know some women were talking about like they may have could have gotten pregnant or something, but then they were like how sick they would have been potentially even just carrying the baby. So it's, it's a lot of things that I think, and I think um, with what you're doing and how you're advocating and helping women, this added piece to it helps out a lot because there's a lot of people who don't want to talk about that part of it as um, far as either um, sparing their eggs or not, or if they can't. Yes. And you being so vocal about that is, is a good thing. So you end up going through all this treatment and at what point, because I know you say you did eventually get linked up to different people, but at what point did you get linked up 
with support groups? Was it during treatment or was it after you finished everything? It was during treatment, but I'm going to be honest. I've never been like a group C type of person. Like I was never, I would be in groups, but I wouldn't like make a lot of comments and things like that. And so um, something kind of struck me during the time that I was in groups, something mm -hmm. happened. I won't say any names, but something happened. And like somebody that I care very dearly for was like under attack online from mm -hmm. like a whole different people. And I, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Like all I, in my mind, it was like this community of women, we're supposed to support each other, protect each other, be there for each other. And to see them be so malicious, that kind of like ignited this like thing in me, like I'm not standing for it. You know, I'm not standing for people not treating each other fairly or not supporting one another. Like we're all hurting. We're all going through things that we don't want to go through. Our family suffering. We're losing things. And the, the you know, the least we could do is like be there for each other. Right. Turning each other and, you know, not supporting one another is just like not acceptable for me. So that's what like ignited Linkage Beauty. I wanted to showcase women. I wanted to find them. I wanted to let them know that they're beautiful no matter what, you know, that they're supported mm -hmm. I'm up until like three or four o'clock in the morning on the phone, talking to women. My, my phone is open. They could text me. They could call me, whatever, because I didn't have that necessarily. I had some people there, but I wanted it to be bigger. I wanted to do more. And yes, it's, it's stressful to me sometimes. And I have Kim, Kim is like my life coach. Okay. Uh -huh. Kimberly, like my life coach. And sometimes I go to her and I'm like, I can't do it. I'm going crazy. But then I'll just kind of regroup. Sometimes you got to get it out so you can go back again. You know, this is not the type of job where we can give up and we can say, oh, I'm tired. I can't do this anymore. We got to get it out and then we got to come back to work the next day. So, yeah. so you, so that happened during treatment and yes. then after treatment. And so do you, you did, I want to make for sure that we did touch on this part. So you did, did you have a lot of support from your family members when you were going through treatment and you know, no. you did not. Okay. I mean, I had some, you know, I, I don't want to say none at all, right, but right. for, I will be on, I'm always going to be honest for the ones that mattered. No, mm -hmm. I, um, in, inducted family and I grew my family as I became more open. And as I open myself up to people, I, I, I grew my family. You know, I grew what I have today, the tribe of people that are in my life today. And that's what matters because we can kind of go into darkness when, when you get diagnosed and the people that you love the most are not there. Mm. It's like going to even more darkness. And so mm -hmm. I refuse to do that. You know, I refuse. Like if God gave me another opportunity to be here, I was going to use that time to be happy and use that time to be with people that chose me. And so that's what, that's, what's important to me. Not who wasn't there, but who is there now. Yeah. That's yeah. important. No, that, and that's why I wanted you to talk about it because I think when we had talked privately, you mm -hmm. know, you shared a little bit about some lack of support, you know, and we ain't going to go into detail about everything, but my thing is, People need to know they're not alone when they're feeling like they are alone because they might really be alone. <laughs> and they yes. may feel that, hey, look, my mom or my dad or my husband even or my children should be there. But it isn't always the case. Sometimes they're not there. And like right. you stated, you then find your village. You find mm -hmm. your people who you can link with and you who will have your back and you'll have their back. And they do not always have to be blood related. Mm -hmm. um, and what you said really important was that people that wanted you right yeah. and that's what sometimes it boils down to like you're not well, tolerated you, you yes. they want you they want mm -hmm. you just as much as you want them yes. and I think within certain you know um that's why I have to be so careful who we invite into our really inner circle we may have all these other circles outer circles all, so many circles of people around us but that core that core uh you really want to be very wise in choosing who that core is. Absolutely. You got to protect your yeah. peace, protect you your, your whole environment. You can't, you know, let anything in that's not pouring in good and pouring in the positive. Anything that's right. taken away from you or anything that's bringing negativity, you have to let it go because life is so short. It is. You know, we just can't take anything for granted. Any moment, like we can 
not be here. I've lost so many people that I care about so much throughout this journey, meeting different women and we're on the phone today. And then the next day I find out they're no longer here. So life means a lot to me, like celebrating yeah. birthdays, things like that. Those things are important because you never know when, you know, your time is going to come. And then even the fact that because of the type of cancer you had, the stage of it, it makes it even more real for you. Not to say it doesn't make real for all of us, but I'm just saying, like, it, I think your situation, they had to move so quick and you were so young. Like, all that plays factors. And we all have different stories. And that's the beauty of why I like to hear stories is because we all have different stories, all have different backgrounds. But at the end of the day, we can all help one another. Um, and so you said Kimberly Bowles, right? Is mm -hmm. like your coach. Yes. And can you talk a little bit about when you actually got connected with Kimberly? What did that look like? She has been up here, but I'll let you share what you all do. Um, but and I think she's actually watching now. Uh, but if you could kind of elaborate on how that connection happened, and because it seems like she's very significant in your life. Yeah, <laughs> very, very important to me when it comes to. A lot of things, especially the work that I do, um, she's mm -hmm. just always been open to me. Like she lets me be who I am. Like I don't have to be anybody else. I could just be Mimi. I can say what I want to say. I can feel how I want to feel. She never judges me. She never makes me feel anything less than like her sister. And that's mm -hmm. the, the only way that I can put it. Like she never makes me feel anything less than, than loved and appreciated and all of those things, she's always been super duper supportive of Linkage Beauty. Anything that I do, she gets me involved in things that I know nothing about. Just, you know, so with you, it's just like she just brings me around goodness. And so I can do nothing but forever just like admire her, her hard work and, and, and work ethic and just quality of work. Like she gets the job done and she doesn't need to be seen to do it. You know, she's very classy. She's very quiet, but the job gets done. You feel the impact of not putting on a shirt and what they bring to the community. And I just respect her so much for her hard work. And I respect her for the woman that she is, the mom she is, the sister she is to all of us. Mm -hmm. And she's helped me so much get to where I am right now. Cause you know, I, maybe like three days ago, I'm on her phone, like breaking down, like I can't, I can't, right. but She's like talking me through. She's calm. She's like, no, you know, we're not doing this. Like just yes. calm down, talk it through. And that's it. And you, everybody, I don't care who you are, needs that one person, no matter what, that mm -hmm. they can just talk to. And she understands it's different because of course I have like my sister who like I talk to about everything too, but my sister is not going to understand from a standpoint of breast cancer and what we're dealing with in the community as advocates and things like that. She's only going to understand because she loves me and I'm her sister. But Kim can see um, what I'm doing, what I, the impact that I'm trying to make and all the things that I've gone through. Right. And um, she definitely is the definition of like bringing me into you know, this world and showing me that not everybody in this community is the same. Like not everybody is, everyone is different. Everyone has their own way of doing things and mm -hmm. don't be afraid to be who you are, you know? So I'll always love her. I'll always respect her. She'll yeah. always. Have so when did you, when did you all connect? Cause this um, is significant to like how linkage, like you stated, started. So you said you connected a lot during, was she one of the groups that you connected to during? And by the way, everybody not putting on a shirt is the name of the um, organization that we're talking about. And Kimberly Bowles has been up here before. She's the uh, founder of that organization. But so was it in, it was during treatment that you and her connected, correct? Yeah, connected online, just like talking to each other and kind of just like, just being motivational to one another and inspiring to one another and coming like we would be involved in like little side things and I would see her and I would I did my research on her like I went right. and I read her like who is this person like and why is everybody talking about her and what does she do and once I found out like all the work that she does and the changes that she had made even then I was very impressed and I was very inspired and so it just so happened that I in one of the groups, it was something going on at the time and um, stuff had happened. And that's basically how we became very acquainted because okay. I felt the need 
could just be like, nobody's messing with Kim. You leave her alone. And if you deal with her, you're going to have to deal with me. So <laughs> once I said that, it was over with after that. It's like, that's yeah. my sister. And I know oh, yeah, I have sorry. <laughs> It, um, it, it was over from that point. So then Leakage Beauty started, y'all connected, mm-hmm. and you became more ad, more of an advocate in, mm-hmm. the, um, well, in the breast cancer community. Yeah. Um, ours, so some of the things that you advocate for, what are some of the things that really mean, and I, I know this is where linkage comes in too, but also because Kim and that whole situation is about being, you know, being very visible as far as being flat. Yeah. If you mm-hmm. want to explain a little bit of what that looks like, like what you yeah. really go hard. Because all of this, you got some people that go hard over um, just overall breast cancer awareness. Some people go hard, you know, different things, maybe yeah. genetics or whatever. What are the areas that you really, it's like, okay, this is what fires me up. This is yeah. my passion. What are those areas for you? I, I want to say, although um, I'm on the board of, of not putting on a shirt and I heavily advocate for aesthetic flat closure, mm-hmm. um, Link Beauty Movement was created to see the beauty in survivorship, um, going through treatment, fighting, and just surviving. Like, just to feel like I'm still beautiful, no matter if I'm a flatty, if I'm a uni, if I, you know, have all these different things going on, I'm still beautiful. And so that's what I advocate for, not giving up on yourself, um, mm-hmm. self-awareness, self-care, you know, just being in tune with yourself and loving yourself because I legitimately lost myself before I decided to come up with all this. I wasn't this person. I was very wow. like sure. I didn't, I hated my body after I got the mastectomy. I didn't realize that I had aesthetic flat closure and that I was actually one of the women that was on the better end of the yeah. spectrum. So later on, like I just was still dealing with the fact that I had no breasts and mm-hmm. who's going to want me, you know, um, who's going to, at this time, my, my marriage had kind of ended and it was just like, I was going through a lot. So it was just like, what am I going to do? But just something in me and like I said, not putting on a shirt and other women, not just Kim, but other women um, just being in my life and showing me that no matter what, you're beautiful. And I wanted to project that on everyone else. Like I want everyone to feel no matter what you're going through, you could be laying in the hospital right now. You're still beautiful. You're still wanted. You still have value, all of that. You're still worthy because we, we, we kind of get lost in some, some of these things. And so that's what I advocate for. Okay. Um, Spreading awareness, love, beauty, and surviving. Yeah. And it sounds also like you definitely go hard for self-care, like just of your mind and your body and who you are. You mentioned something. I got to touch. I got, I got to get you to hear what you have to say about this. So you stated that this was hard for you as far as like going through the double mastectomy and losing your breast before you even had a double mastectomy. There's two things I want to hit on before you even had a double mastectomy. Did you already have issues with you yes okay yeah I wanted to bring that up because there's some people it starts at the point of you know what we go through biopsy all that the scarring and stuff and that's when they start realizing oh I got you know I have body image issues because of cancer then you have some of us we have body issues images about body self and everything before breast cancer this may have either exacerbated it or it made us come to a point of acceptance of i don't give a darn i'm beautiful regardless because yeah. dag on it i'm alive <laughs> like i'm alive and god's not done with me so yeah. can you kind of speak to that like who you were before and then did it make it worse like mentally for you once you got your breasts um after you lost your breasts or did it like from what it sounds like it's like it, it did get a little worse but then yeah, it, was, it, was a pro- building. Yeah, it was a process like I I didn't want to accept it I was I didn't even look in the mirror like I didn't want to look in the mirror every time I did I was crying it just was too much mm-hmm. um because I thought that I would be fine with it like I talked myself into it like hey it's just breasts you know I'm not I had little A cups anyway. It's not a big deal, but it's not a big deal until it actually happened and they weren't there. And all I saw was the scars. Mm -hmm. It was just like, it was like, I didn't know what to do with that, you know? And so I didn't want to even deal with it anymore until 
Um, like I said, I one day got up the nerve enough and I called one of my friends over and I asked her to take some pictures of me. And she took some pictures of me and I looked at them and I was like, oh, it's not that bad. You know, like I can kind of, I kind of, in a way I felt like a little sexy because I was like, I'm in my own lane now. It's like not a lot of women. It's a lot of women like me now, I know. But when I first <laughs> was presented with it, it was like, I'm in my own lane. I have to make, I have to make it work. You know, I have to make it work for myself first, not about anybody else. Because at first it was about what other people perceived of me and what they thought. But it turned into what I thought about myself. And that's what made it, made things kind of change. And then, yes, I finally got to the point where I was just like, I don't care. Like I'm, I, I, I love who I am. I started to take more pictures. I started to be more open. And then I started to get a lot of feedback from like a lot of women from all over the world. And I didn't know what to do with that. I was just like, oh my goodness, like over this picture, you know, like, oh my gosh. But I saw that I was making other women inspired and they, they wanted to take off their shirts and they wanted to do photo shoots. And then I go and do a walk in New York and I see all of these women and then I'm taking off my shirt outside and I'm all feeling liberated. So it's like, again, um, Kim and, and, and Christy Avelia, like have me feeling like, you know, I can like run the world. You know what I mean? Like, yes, we're flat. Yes. Cancer took this away from us, but we're still here. You know, like we are still here and we can still make so many things happen. We can still change so many lives. And so that's what gets me motivated. Like I'm still struggling to this day with a lot of things, but what keeps me motivated is knowing that once I get this degree, I'm going to open up my linkage community centers and I'm going to be able to help women all over. It's going to start where I am in the DMV, but I'm one day going to be able to help women in every state like get through this cancer thing, no matter what stage they're in, right. no matter what through, I'm going to be able to help them. That's what keeps me motivated. So you spoke of degree. What degree are you, <laughs> what degree are you going for right now? I'm in science and human services at Walden University. So I'll be a human services professional practitioner once I'm done with all this. So I will be running my own um, linkage community centers and making sure that the people in the community that are low income, underinsured, things like that, that they are the first people to get the resources and the access and the tools that they need. But it's not like it's just tailored to a certain dynamic of people. It's for all women. But I want it to be available for women who don't have because right. I was, I, I am one of those. I can't say yeah. what one of those. I still don't have the support that I, that I feel like I should have or the support that should be out there. But this helps me build what I'm trying to do for the future to know what I need to do. So women won't have to go through what I'm going through. Right. Right. It's your story. And it's amazing how our stories link up with our, it's our purpose. Mm -hmm. it's good, the bad and the ugly of it all and the beauty of it all. It all it's our purpose. It's what you yeah. destined to do. And sometimes what people fail to realize is that what we are destined to do, who is better to actually help someone because you've been through it. So yeah. you've been through it. So because of your story, you can help other people go through with their story and their pain. And I just, I love that. And I love, I love your vision for linkage. I love what you're doing currently. And then also your, your vision for the whole overall organization. Um, you spoke about you were in a marriage. Was that something would you say yes or no? You don't have to get into it. But I learned a lot of women, marriage is going great and then they get breast cancer and then it falls apart. Was that, was it, or was this something that was already starting to happen and this uh, added to it? I just feel like um, we rushed it. You know, I do feel like we both loved each other a lot, but um, he proposed uh, right, you know, when I was going through chemo and everything. And so, of course, it kind of just like fell into place a little bit because, you know, he stepped in and was like really a good support system yeah. as far as and taking care of me. But I just don't think we both were ready for what was to come. You know, we we weren't ready. And so I'm just going to stick with the we weren't ready. There was a lot of things that transpired, but I don't think cancer helped at all. You know, it didn't help. But um I feel like for the future, um, I'm not afraid of getting remarried and things like that. I just know to look at it in a different 
um, would go go into a marriage for different reasons than right. what first time, you know, because I'm a whole different I'm a whole different woman than what I was when I got married. Absolutely. When, yeah. So that makes sense because I know, you know, you hear those stories is like that people have been together for 20, 30 years and then they get cancer and then the person leaves. And I'm like, what the heck? Like, um, what happened to like, through all but of I, I do realize like I've been in therapy for like four years now and I realize it's a, it's a lot for another person to deal with. It's, is it, it's not a pass to say, check out on the person who really needs you, but right we don't speak enough about people who are faced with that. We don't know what they go through um, with dealing with the person that they love, seeing them hurt, seeing them about like some people die, you know, yeah. seeing them um, in situations that you can't help them. That has to be a lot on their mental state and on their life in general. So I do feel like it plays a role no matter what, even right. from you take those vows and you're supposed to stick it through, through thick and thin, but we're all only human. And, you know, things happen and in a, in, a, in a perfect world, we would want it to happen that way, but it doesn't always end up that way. It doesn't. But I also I know for, for me, for my children, with my children, I'm like, make for sure, even though someone can tell you that they'll be there no matter what. People change. People can't handle things. People are people. You never know what you can deal with until it happens um, to you. Um, and then even then, sometimes we don't even know if we can deal <laughs> with what's happened to us. But um, I do tell my children, make for sure to have the conversation, though, because I think sometimes we get into marriages and I can speak for my own self because we got married young and you get in marriages and you don't have those conversations because, like you said, you're in love and everything is great and everything is wonderful um, for whatever reason. You know, you're there in that space and you're not thinking about, well, if this happens you know, could you even potentially, you don't have those conversations. Yeah. Young. So, um, but thank you for uh, sharing that part because that's okay. a, that's a different, I, I love the fact you're so open. Like yeah. you know, and if you don't want to be open, you're the type of person to be like, yeah, I ain't going there. Be, <laughs> yeah. You have to be open. Like I'll, you know, I, I know how to, I know what to say and how to say it. You know, you, you're not, you can't say too much, but right. women to think that I'm, um, you know, being fake in any way. Like I'm a human being and we are going all going through the same things. And trust me, people have no idea what I'm going through, but mm -hmm. that's not anyone else's concern. My my mission here is to help and support and spread love. Right. That's in here. You know, right. it my duty as a woman to to handle my my life and handle things the way I see fit mm -hmm. and um just stay positive, stay faithful to God and continue doing positive change, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So I want to make for sure that you share with people how they can connect with you okay. and then you can get into your song and stuff too, uh, which I love because I grew up with that song. But, <laughs> but yeah, I want you to, first of all, before you share like where people can find you, is there anything else that you want to share about what's going on now? with maybe yourself or with linkage view anything that may be coming up anything mm -hmm. you want to share um for those of you that don't know um linkage beauty movement LLC also has a component named linkage essentials and i handcraft and hand make my own 100 percent natural wellness products um for your skin for your hair it started out for women who are going through radiation and chemo because our skin you know goes to a whole nother level with all the medications and stuff that we use, but come to find out these all natural ingredients work on everyone. And I have changed so many people's like skin situation, scalp situation. And I'm just so surprised myself, even myself with using it on my body. Like I, I've, I've not bought any star brought lotions or anything like that ever since I started making my products. And I want people to at least Check it out. It's called Linkage Essentials. I have an online store. I have an Instagram, all Linkage Essentials. You can type it in Google. But um, even if you know someone that has like eczema or is fighting with like rashes and has different types of skin issues, there's something that I make that can help for that. And my mission is to help in a more natural way, go all natural with linkage. That's something that I'm really big on because we put so many things into our body, eating 
that's unhealthy and we put so much stuff on our skin. We can't even name the things that's on the lotion bottles in your room right now that you've been buying for years. You can't even name, you can't even pronounce the things on the bottle, but you can pronounce every single last thing that I put in my products. So that's very important to me. Um, Linkage Beauty Movement, we still do the showcasing. I still send out the care boxes. So if you know anyone that's going through cancer right now and you want to send them a care box or you want them to connect with me so they can have someone to talk to, Linkage Beauty is always available. The line is always open 24 um, seven. The links are on the website. Um, wow. You can social media, um, basically everywhere. If you just type in Linkage Beauty Movement LLC and Google, you can find me everywhere. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So you chose the song. So I want mm -hmm. you to tell us the name of the song, the name of the artist and why you chose that song. Um, uh, I forgot the, the, the lady's uh, name who sings it, please forgive me, but it's my favorite song. Mm -hmm. And I think every morning when I wake up, um, and it basically, she is basically talking to God to me. And that's how I feel like without him, I don't know what I would be doing right now because I was ready to give up. Even this year, like this year, I decided that I was going to go back to church and I was going to try to do something different and try to get myself realigned with like my purpose and, you know, what I'm actually here for. And it just changed my life. I listen to that song every day. I I've changed my life in so many ways. I'm, I'm very prayerful. And I used to, I used to talk about God a lot and I used to be, um, I used to say like, yeah, I have a relationship with God, but it's different when you really get a relationship with God and you really start to make the changes in your life. And it's not about, oh, you think you're this because you go to church now. It's not even about any of that because I don't even have to go to, to feel this peace that I have right now. So this song um, helps me feel that. And um, I listen to it every day. I've shared it with so many different people and it's probably going to be something that I want to play. Like when my time is up, when I have like my little memorial service, that's going to be the song that I want everyone to listen to and dance to because it just makes me so happy because all I can do is thank him every day for everything that he's done because without him, I don't know where I would be. Right. And what's the name of the song? Do you remember? Um, I, I think it's, I want to thank you. I want to I mean, yeah. thank you, Heavenly Father. Yeah, yes. I think it's Alicia Moore. Is Alicia Moore? Yes, I think it is. I think it is. Yeah. It's it's a song that I've heard all my life. By, by everybody's like, oh, I know that song. Like you can't yep. remember who sings it and all <laughs> know the words and you know how it makes you feel every time. Yeah. Yeah. So when I advertisement, I was just like, oh, this is so awesome. I think to my dad, he's like, how she know that was your favorite song? <laughs> I had no clue. <laughs> But we, yeah. I love that song. Like I remember yeah. hearing my brothers and my sisters playing it growing up. And it's just, it's been a song that's just stuck with me all my life. So yeah, yeah I, I absolutely love it. Um, and what is one word, one word that you can leave with everyone and explain why you are sharing this word? Uh, for someone who's out there who may have scars, like you, you know, you had scars and you were dealing with them and they were fresh and you had to get through, like, what are we gonna do with these scars? You know, mentally, how can I process this? Or whether they have a wound that is fresh, whether it's a mental or physical wound, what's a word that you can give to the audience to help them through their open wounds, their scars that may, you know, be completely healed that they just haven't gotten through? I have two words, but I'm just gonna do the one. No, you the, can do two. You can do two. The one is love. That's my word. Love because loving yourself is the most important thing throughout this whole entire journey from when you are diagnosed to when you get when you make it through something and you get to go to the next, you have to continue to love yourself. There's going to be a lot of times where you're tested, your faith is tested, you know, everything is tested, but if you continue to love yourself, and take care of yourself, love your body, like love everything about yourself because this is this is all you have until you're not here anymore. It's like, this is what you have. So why not pour into it the goodness that it deserves and why not love on it the way you were supposed to? It's really sad that for me, it took for me to get diagnosed for me to love myself as much as I do now. I, I didn't love myself as much as I do now because 
um, I didn't have value for myself and I didn't have standards and things like that. So that's why a lot of things weren't right for me. But when you have your life like flash before your eyes and you can kind of almost grab, you know, it and say, oh my God, I almost wasn't there. I almost wasn't here anymore. You kind of can put a lot of things into perspective. What's important, what's not important. So love to me is very important. Love yourself, love those who love you, love life you know, and just love others. Like I said, I get the most out of just like waking up in the morning and seeing someone say, thank you, Mimi, for talking to me last night, or thank you for sending me this in the mail, or thank you, I, that meant so much to me. Mm-hmm. That just makes my whole entire day because making a woman smile, because we don't know what we're going through, that right. is me happy. Okay. Mm-hmm. I love it. So you have used everything that I was going to say to you. First of all, I was going to tell you love. Like I had that to talk to you about, but I was like, okay, she just said that. Then yep. it was also um, what you thought about yourself as being a warrior. And so when we were talking about it, I was like, oh, I have this, I would go get my husband to get it, but it's a statue of a um, African queen sitting on a Libra. And it's so beautiful. It's one of my, one of my art pieces that I absolutely love. And when I, when, as you're talking, I kept on seeing that particular statue. I'll send you a picture of it so you can see what I'm talking Please about. Please do. But, um, it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. My husband bought me, he got in this, he was in this point in life where he just buy me all this art that was African-American and it's just absolutely beautiful. So I'm seeing you a picture of it. But as you were talking, um, two, a few things, it's just continue to be you, which I know you will unapologetically but you do it in a way also that's very respectful, which I think is a good thing because that brings people even closer to you, even if they don't like what you say to them. Yeah. Sometimes God will have people in our life that may not like us, but they have to respect us because of the anointing that's upon our lives. And you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. The other thing is, so you have to continue to be who you are. The other piece to that is that the compassion, the compassion that you have will continue to exude to other people, but also allow those people to be just as compassionate back to you as you continue to persevere everything that you've been called to do because you have purpose. Every person that's come up here so far on this platform has purpose. And some of us have even more higher calling than some others. Yeah. Um, we're all called, but some of us are actually chosen for certain aspects of things. And I'm sure you can understand the perspective which I'm coming to you from. Um, within that, continue to worship. Continue to worship to the God whom you serve, because that's where all your healing is going to come from. Because like you stated, no matter what church you go in, no matter where you go, if you don't have that intimacy, it's nothing. Exactly. People cannot create that for you as you <laughs> So continue to operate in all those things. I don't know when, but I do know if you stay pure and true to that, he will continue to lead the way and continue to open the doors. So I just encourage you to continue to be who you are. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You do the same because you are a beautiful person. This is a wonderful platform. I am so delighted and honored to be here with you. I appreciate you so, so much. And I wish you nothing but the best in, in everything that you're doing. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, so one day I'm going to have lots like yours that are long. It's okay. It's coming, no, girl. It's coming girl every time I think about it, I'm like, maybe I should come. Then I'm like, no, I'm not going to come. They're, they're so you're, you inspire me all around with Thank the flat you. and the hair and just, you're just a beautiful Thank person. Beautiful you person. So Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming up here. Everyone, thank you for watching today. It's another episode of Our Scar Speak. Remember that our scars speak a story. When you're going to tell that story, we don't know, but just we encourage you to share. We encourage you to share the scars that are mental and physical because your scars can help another person get through their wounds. We love you. Until next time, we see you later. Bye.